it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chaz Lichardelli. This week, a former police officer guilty of murdering George Floyd, civil rights icon Jesse Jackson gives us his thoughts on that verdict. America is back centre stage in the battle against climate change and infrastructure might finally be the key. The first. America prepared this week as if there were an approaching storm. Businesses shuttered, storefronts boarded up, police and National Guard troops deployed on the streets of cities across the nation. They were bracing not for a hurricane or tornado, but for a verdict in the trial of the former police officer accused of killing 46-year-old George Floyd in May last year. I'm praying the verdict is the right verdict, which is overwhelming in my view. We're expecting to hear that verdict read between 4.30 and 5 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon. After less than 11 hours of jury deliberation, Judge Peter Cahill was ready to deliver their verdict as Derek Chauvin, behind a face mask, glanced from judge to jury and back again. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Count two. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count two, Third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. Verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. Derek Chauvin's been found guilty! Derek Chauvin has been found guilty! There was an extraordinary outpouring of emotion on the streets of Minneapolis. Jubilation mixed with relief and from George Floyd's family, Today, we are able to breathe again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Underlining the importance of the moment, President Biden delivered remarks at the White House. Nothing can ever bring their brother, their father back. But this can be a giant step forward in the march toward justice in America. And almost as an aside, he concluded with this message. This can be a moment of significant change. Meanwhile, Derek Chauvin, now a convicted murderer, was taken away in handcuffs. He may have to wait up to two months for his sentence to be delivered. He is facing up to a maximum 40 years in jail for second-degree murder. The same sentence looms over his three co-accused, former officers Alexander Kuhn, Thomas Lane and Tu Thao, who are charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder and manslaughter. Shortly before the Chauvin verdict was delivered, a 16-year-old girl, Makia Bryant, was shot and killed by another police officer in Columbus, Ohio. Body camera footage appears to show Bryant holding a knife and trying to stab two other girls before she was shot four times. Yeah, but back to that Chauvin sentence. We should be clear that even though Chauvin was convicted of three separate charges, the judge is expected to allow him to serve those sentences concurrently because they're all for the same crime. Also, the presumptive sentence in Minnesota for both murder charges is 12 and a half years, with a discretionary range of 10 and a bit to 15 years, although the prosecution claim the aggravating factors warrant an increased sentence, including that uh, Floyd was particularly vulnerable, that he was treated with particular cruelty, and that children were present. So that's the sentence. But what do the charges actually mean? Well, second degree manslaughter means culpable negligence and reckless actions by Chauvin caused Floyd's death. So the jury is saying, yes, Chauvin's knee killed Floyd. Third degree murder involves Chauvin causing Floyd's death by committing an eminently dangerous act that was highly likely to cause death. Seems likely if he was found guilty of the other charge. And then the second degree murder charge required Chauvin to cause Floyd's death while assaulting him by intentionally applying unlawful force without consent that resulted in substantial bodily harm. So that required the prosecution to also prove Chauvin's force was unlawful, which the jury says they did. Now, there's been a lot of takes out there about all this, so let's start with the absolute worst of them. First, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Thank you, George Floyd, for sacrificing your life for justice, for being there to call out to your mom. How, how heartbreaking was that? Call out for your mom. I can't breathe. But because of you and because of thousands, millions of people around the world who came out for justice, your name will always be synonymous 
with justice. We know what she means, but what she said essentially thanked George Floyd for choosing to die so his death could be accounted for appropriately. Kind of odd. But this was odder. I'm glad that he was found guilty on all charges. Yeah. Even if he might not be guilty of all charges. Oh, my God. Oh. I am glad that he is guilty of all charges because I want a verdict that keeps this country from going up oh. in flames. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, my goodness. No. What do you mean? When your pals on Fox News are audibly groaning about your opinion, that does not augur well for your chances of winning the Pulitzer. But the non-ludicrous views could essentially be divided into glass half full and glass half empty. The glass half full position was that even on stations like Fox News, people were saying things like... Clearly, the, uh, the, the, the verdict is supported by the facts. Make no mistake, the facts are solid on this verdict. This verdict will be upheld on a and even the fraternal order of the police, they're the guys who defend every cop, no matter what they do, said justice has worked as it should and the trial was fair and due process was served. So that was very encouraging. On the other hand, the glass half empty position is to point out that each year between 900 and 1,000 people are shot and killed by police. And each year, around 400 to 500 of those killings are deemed to be justifiable homicides. So, what about the other people killed? That's quite a gap you see there, and we know not all of those deaths are justifiable because of the payouts. From 2015 to 2019, there were over $2 billion in payouts for police misconduct just from the 20 biggest police departments alone. Yet over a 15 year period when there were over 7,000 shooting slash killings by police that were not ruled to be justifiable homicides, only 140 police were charged. And out of them, only 44 were convicted. And this is what they were convicted of. Only seven were convicted of flat out murder. And 22 others were convicted on murder-like charges. So the glass half empty position is that it takes a myriad of video evidence, numerous in-person witnesses, a number of police testifying against the cop, a slew of medical experts, an all-star prosecution team, and a racially diverse jury just to convict a cop who has previously faced 18 misconduct complaints in 19 years. Let's hope that's not in fact, the bar that you need to clear for justice against a dodgy police officer, John. We'll soon find out if it is. We do have a very special guest for you now, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who has, of course, witnessed so many significant moments in America's long battle for racial justice. He was with Dr Martin Luther King in Memphis the day he was killed. He was with Barack Obama on the night he was elected. And he was with George Floyd's family in Minnesota this week to see his killer convicted of murder. We have captioned our interview because Reverend Jackson's speech has been affected by his Parkinson's disease. Reverend Jesse Jackson, welcome to Planet America. Yes, sir. Reverend, we saw a combination of jubilation and a sense of relief this week after that murder verdict came down against Derek Chauvin. You were there in Minneapolis. What were you feeling? Relief, but not a time for celebration. Relief because the first time in history from Minnesota, they a uh, policeman had been uh, charged, really, uh, and convicted for killing a black in the history of the state. On the other hand, it's the first time, not a touchdown. It's a long struggle for racial equality in this country. Remember, the police are white nationalists, white supremacists, uh, disguised as policemen, and their behavior is atrocious. Reverend Jackson, there's been a bit of a trend since the verdict where a lot of white people have referred to it as justice, but a lot of black people have referred to it as accountability. Why do you think that distinction exists and how would you personally describe the verdict? It was, it was a measure of justice, a step in the right direction. But the fact of the matter is that uh, as he was, as George was killed, men and women killed since that time. There's nothing about yesterday's decision that affects the behavior in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, for example. So it is the cause, it's relief, we didn't take a big setback yesterday, but we're not advanced as far as some people want to think. Clearly, one police officer being sent to jail for murder doesn't solve this massive problem overnight, Reverend. But does this change the way that police officers will interact, particularly with African Americans, going forward? Well, I think that when you have a case this visible, you make illegal lynching illegal, 
That's a big step in the right. Of course, how many other states will adopt this? It is the state's right. But my friend, this struggle here continues in a big way. Mary has been very violent towards black citizens, very violent towards us. Two and four years of slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow, 5,000 blacks were lynched. We've been a tough, tough sledding for us here. We make progress against the odds, but the odds are great. Reverend, are you concerned that it took a nine minute, perfectly filmed video and a whole stack of eyewitnesses and medical experts for a police officer to finally be convicted of murder? Or are you happy just to take the victories when they come? The fact of the matter is that if it were not for the camera, the report, they would they were, they were lie on him. Uh, that strikes me also, you had four white officers in the middle of the black community. So the, the, the police, did not, the makeup does not correspond with, with the demographics of, of the city, for example. Uh, but also at the store where the report was given that uh, a $20 bad check was cashed, that store is still open. Uh, and, and it's still on management. So it, 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 there are some things that have not changed. So the management, they call the police, they're still there. And police officers, and, and the black police chief now, but he has a lot of work to do to make, it, make the force look like the city. Jesse Jackson, you know Joe Biden very well indeed. You know that for over half a century he has been a supporter of civil rights. But you also know in the 1990s he was the principal author of a crime bill that many still blame for the mass incarceration of African Americans. So do you think that Joe Biden is the man for this moment? I think Joe, he's perfectly positioned that a new America in many ways without voting patterns be elected Joe Biden. He's responding to that vote. He's, he's, he's doing a great job. Uh, and in some sense it's different than, than Obama because the race of, the racist uh, knives were out so strong for Barack, uh, you couldn't, it was just unmanageable. Joe Biden is doing a good job at this point. We, we, support, we thank him for support very much. He's created a new environment. It's just a great contrast to Trump, who stirred the, uh, the Confederates up. What reforms to the police would you like to see take place? One, they, they should not have protected immunity. They, they, they work with people, people don't work for them. So they think they a badge, a gun, and a, and a white supremacist ideology. They, they run them up. So number one, we should remove protect the immunity. Secondly, they, they should have residents. They should have to live where they police. Now, the focus of the police in Minneapolis don't live in Minneapolis. They come every day like an hired gunman. I think that needs to happen. Background checks, because the weapons in this country become so, uh, so plentiful. Numbers are safe, including police. Uh, we voted on George Floyd, but every day we have these mass killings, three, four, and five people killed every day because of the access to weapons that no one should have on a, a, a domestic arrangement. Finally, Reverend, if the Chauvin verdict is either partly or fully reversed on appeal, do you still think something would have been achieved on Monday or would we be back to square one or possibly even worse? Maybe worse because hopes are so high. There's no disappointment with that. Where there's no disappointment with that previous hope. Hopes are so high. If anything happens to alter the outcome, if he's not getting his full time in jail, it'd be awful. Matter of fact, I'm concerned now that he has eight weeks to go before he'd be sentenced. Now, the same forces that sort of have them um, bold enough to attack the U.S. Capitol, he, he's their hero now. They'll be mobilized. I don't know what will happen between now and the time he is. So it's a jail. Uh, it's been a very, very tough period in America for black people. Reverend Jesse Jackson, great to have you back on the program. Thanks for your time today. God bless you down under. As for what lawmakers might be able to do from here, President Biden has renewed the push for the Senate to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, which bans chokeholds, mandates training against discriminatory profiling and creates a national police misconduct registry to try and stop sacked officers from just moving into state and re-enlisting. Last year, as a senator, now Vice President Kamala Harris co-sponsored that bill, which narrowly passed the House but then stalled in the Senate. The President and I will continue to urge the Senate to pass this legislation, not as a panacea for every problem, but as a start. This work 
is long overdue. We'll see how that goes. Meanwhile, US Attorney General Merrick Garland has also announced the Justice Department will investigate the Minneapolis Police Department to see if there is a pattern of unconstitutional or unlawful activity, including excessive force and discrimination. Most of our nation's law enforcement officers do their difficult jobs honorably and lawfully. I strongly believe that good officers do not want to work in systems that allow bad practices. But before we move too far down the road from here, we probably should consider the potential for Chauvin to appeal. Mm. Democratic Representative Maxine Waters made these comments before the jury was sequestered. And I hope uh, that we're going to get a verdict that they say guilty, guilty, guilty. And if we don't, we, got, we cannot go away. And not just manslaughter, right? I mean... Oh, no, not manslaughter. No, no, no. This is, this is guilty for murder. I don't know whether it's in the first degree, but as far as I'm concerned, it's first degree it's coming from What happens if we do not go get what you just told? What should the people do? What should protesters on the street do? I didn't hear you. What happens? What should protesters do? Well, we, we got to stay on the street. Uh, and we've got to get more active. We've got to get more confrontational. We've got to make sure that they, they know that we need business. And the Republican leader in the House, Kevin McCarthy, was not happy about that, tweeting that Maxine Waters was inciting violence in Minneapolis. And he described it as dangerous rhetoric. More importantly, the judge was not happy about it either, saying... Well, I'll give you that Congresswoman Waters may have given you something on appeal that may result in this whole trial being overturned. Now, according to Maxine Waters, when she talked about being confrontational, she meant confronting the justice system, speaking up and passing legislation. You can judge that for yourself. But she also said she misheard the question slightly. And if you watch again, you can see that it was probably true that she was actually answering a question about what protesters should generally do, not specifically do about a not guilty verdict. Congresswoman, what happens if we do not get, get what you just told? What should the people do? What should protesters on the street do? I didn't hear you. What happens? What, what should protesters do? Well, we, we got to stay on the street. Okay, and then she said all this stuff about confrontational. Nevertheless, if the jury had found Chauvin not guilty, Waters' comments would not have improved the crowd's mood at all. And she was applying at least some potential pressure on the jury in her demand for a guilty verdict. So Republicans tried to censure her, something that has only happened 23 times in the House's entire history. And predictably, it failed along party lines. The judge, while visibly annoyed though, did let it slide. This goes back to what I've been saying from the beginning. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case, especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch and our function. Their failure to do so, I think, is abhorrent, but I don't think it has prejudiced us with additional uh, material that would prejudice this jury. They have been told not to watch the news. I trust they are following those instructions. A congresswoman's opinion really doesn't matter a whole lot. And we'll inevitably see what the appeals court judge has to say about that, John. Yeah, and I should note, those earlier apparently prejudicial comments from President Biden before the verdict was announced was after the jury had been sequestered, unlike Maxine Waters. So there is a bit of a difference there. President Biden, meanwhile, has joined with 40 world leaders, Pope Francis, Bill Gates and a bunch of others for a two-day virtual conference, marking America's symbolic return to global leadership against climate change. Vice President Harris kicked things off, and true to form in the COVID Zoom era, there were a few glitches. Your Excellencies, Your Excellencies distinguished, distinguished leaders, leaders, and esteemed, and colleagues, esteemed colleagues, from colleagues from around the world. But that echo was nothing compared to the very awkward moment when Vladimir Putin didn't realise it was his turn to talk. And that went on for about a minute and a half. Somebody is going to be nice and cool in Siberia, I think. <laughs> Meanwhile, President Biden had a big announcement to make. New, more aggressive US emissions targets. The United States sets out on the road to cut greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. Reducing 2005 emissions levels by 50% by 2030 is a bold move, although the one step forward, two steps back nature of American leadership on this topic cannot be ignored. Bill Clinton signed the Kyoto Agreement, George W. Bush then refused to implement it, Barack Obama signed the Paris Accord, Donald Trump 
tossed it right out again. So what will it mean now that the United States has re-entered the Paris Climate Treaty and is seeking to return to a climate leadership role? Joining us is Rachel Kite. She's a senior advisor to the UN Secretary General on Climate Change and Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University in Massachusetts. Professor Kite, welcome to Planet America. It's nice to be with you. I wonder, in your view, does the world really need American leadership when it comes to climate change? Because as a leader, every four to eight years, they kind of turn around and go to the back of the pack or head off in their own direction. Well, yeah, I think that the world knows more about midterm elections uh, in the United States than it's ever wanted to or perhaps needed to before. But global climate change is something that we need everybody's leadership. And so to have an economy the size of the United States outside of a sort of race to the top, which is what's uh, been set off now, is problematic. And so now we have China, the European Union, and the United States together. That's more than 60% of uh, global GDP committed to really ambitious targets. So I think, yes, it does matter. Professor, is a US target of 50% fewer emissions than 2005 by 2030 ambitious enough? It puts them um, it puts them in the leadership pack for the race, as it were. It's 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 50 to 52 percent cuts over 2005 levels. A large part of that was being achieved, and then there's been a sort of setback in the last few years. Uh, the pressure sort of came off at the federal governmental level, and so I think it, it's achievable. Um, and I would hope that the United States will emulate some other countries by sort of under promising and over delivering. And I think that if the uh, administration is successful in selling this to the American people as being where the good quality jobs are for the next 20 years, then this could actually go faster than perhaps people realise. And practically speaking, what would achieving that target involve? So it's going to re require a, a massive investment in renewable energy, an extraordinary investment in the transport infrastructure in the United States, which is where most of the emissions are coming from at the moment. So that means really building out um, uh, charging, uh, electric charging stations, moving fleets uh, to electric, um, so public procurement, you know, all school buses in the country, but also like incentivizing uh, people to buy electric. And it means they're uh, working on the transport uh, infrastructure in cities. Um, and I think that that's what you begin to see in the, both the jobs plan and the infrastructure plan. So uh, energy and then transport and then uh, some other things as well. But those two are absolutely at the heart of the transformation. You mentioned the, the word infrastructure there, Professor. Obviously, we're, we're yet to see whether the, the $2.3 trillion infrastructure bill is going to pass the Senate. A crucial vote. Senator Manchin of West Virginia, uh, a deep red coal state... Uh, if that infrastructure bill doesn't pass or it's significantly changed, uh, is there a chance of getting to that 50% target by 2030? I think, well, so three things. First of all, the, the business sector, an extraordinary number of companies have signed up and before the summit and said, look, you know, we really need ambitious government guardrails, really, for this race to zero, and then we can perform and compete within it. Um, some, I think over 100 companies have, have signed something called the pledge, which is really to get to net zero by 2040. And so there's sort of a, there is a comp competition already going on within the private sector. Secondly, states and cities are already looking at their competitiveness and their resilience. I mean, I live in the state of Massachusetts, where we have a Republican governor, where we have a net zero by 2050 law for the state of Massachusetts. And so this is going whatever happens in Washington. But Ideally, this would pass uh, the uh, House and the Senate, and ideally, Republicans would start to see that in their own um, uh, in their own sort of hometowns and, and, and cities, that this is actually in the best interest uh, of their own communities. And so, uh, the politics in Washington are pretty fractious. Um, this is difficult, but I think it's achievable. Rachel Cart, we're grateful for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. Negotiations are continuing around Biden's proposed infrastructure bill, but sometimes it's not worth going in for the deal. Let me explain. Here's the deal. Yes, here's the deal. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify. 
Now, Joe Biden's thing has always been reaching across that aisle, and it's no wonder a 2019 poll found 75% of voters want their elected officials to work with the other party. 71% of Americans said the same thing about congressional Republicans and Biden earlier this year. But obviously, this is not always possible. There is, though, one potential zone of compromise. Infrastructure. Uh, it's apparently the bipartisan opportunity that Congress and America needs. So cut to the last few weeks and it is on. What I'm proposing is a one-time capital investment of roughly $2 trillion in America's future. Wow, that is huge news for ooh, Russell 2000 enthusiasts. One point, one three, oh, no, let's not worry about that. Republicans don't support all of Biden's plan, though. Although there is some common ground and I think we can agree on all, a lot of uh, the measures moving forward. The, how much? I would say probably into the six or eight hundred a billion. A one to two trillion dollar infrastructure bill, I think, is very much needed. How about that? But there's only one catch. It, how do you pay for it? Are you just going to keep on doing no, it? No, you don't have the budget. Well, he's right about that. The catch is that Biden wants to fund his infrastructure bill with a corporate tax hike. Republicans, they say absolutely no way. So how do they propose to pay for it? Mitt Romney has suggested that the gas tax might have a role to play. Republican Senator Don Young has personally pitched increasing the gas tax to Biden himself. Whereas on the other hand, the ranking Republican of the House Transport and Infrastructure Committee, sounds relevant, has called for a national program testing out a vehicle miles travel tax. It's essentially a tax on the distances that cars travel regardless of their fuel source. Now look, both that idea and the gas tax hike are reasonable. The gas tax hasn't been raised since 1993, so adjusted for inflation, it's pretty low at the moment. In fact, today, the gas tax raises 45% less per gallon than it did back in 1993. And even ignoring inflation, just because of improving fuel economy and less driving, the CBO projects gas tax revenue would decline by about 1% every year. And that is why even Pete Buttigieg is quite receptive to a mileage tax. What about a mileage-based tax? So I think that shows a lot of promise. If, if we believe in that so-called user pays principle, the idea that part of how we pay for roads is you pay based on how much you drive, uh, the gas tax used to be the obvious way to do it. It's not anymore. So a so-called vehicle miles traveled tax or mileage tax, whatever you want to call it, could be a way to do it. Sounds like compromise, but there are two problems with either gas taxes or mileage-based taxes. One, any driving-based tax affects the poor more because while rich people do tend to drive more, they don't drive nearly as much as their incomes are greater. But also, Buttigieg got absolutely bucketed by conservatives online for his mileage tax musings, providing a nice little preview of what Joe Biden might face if he signed on to a mileage based tax. And if that wasn't clear enough, Senate Republicans sent out a strategy memo noting that they could block Biden's plan by focusing on opposition to a gas tax hike. But you know what won't hurt the poor? Biden's corporate tax hikes. The Tax Policy Centre broke down all of Biden's tax plans last year and found them overwhelmingly targeting the top 1%. Now, Biden hasn't incorporated all of these proposals into his infrastructure bill, but there is a lot of overlap here. What's more, an infrastructure bill without mentioning any revenue stream is actually less popular than an infrastructure bill with a corporate tax hike. That's right. A corporate tax hike possibly adds nine points of approval to an infrastructure bill. So it's no surprise that Biden is at least so far not taking the Republicans' advice. But what about bipartisanship? It's a trap. Listen to the squid. <laughs> yes, here's the deal. And late breaking news. Republicans are now hinting at another payment suggestion, what they call user fee oriented proposals, whatever that means. They say it's a way to assess fees on electric vehicles. 
which may or may not be a mileage tax. If I was Biden, I would be trading very warily around that one. Sage advice, chairs. Now, the American news media has certainly changed rather dramatically in recent decades, to a point where facts struggle to compete with falsehoods for ears, eyes and clicks. Some say re-regulation is the answer, and they want to return to what was called the Fairness Doctrine. Not that long ago, America had relatively few sources of news. President Kennedy has been assassinated. He was shot in his open limousine as he proceeded from Dallas airport to the downtown Dallas area for a scheduled speech. In the 1960s, Walter Cronkite was among the most trusted people in America, so it was a big deal when the iconic newsman delivered a personal assessment of the state of the war in Vietnam. We have been too often disappointed by the optimism of the American leaders, both in Vietnam and Washington, to have faith any longer in the silver linings they find in the darkest clouds. Cronkite had just returned from a trip to Vietnam following the Tet Offensive, believing the US military and government were ignoring reality and misleading the public. But it is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. This is Walter Cronkite. Good night. After seeing Cronkite's broadcast, President Lyndon Johnson is reported to have said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the American people. A month later, Johnson announced he would not be running for re-election. It's still a matter of debate whether Cronkite changed public opinion or simply reflected it. Either way, at that time, it was very rare for a news anchor to express a personal view, unlike today. The feeling most people get when they hear a Barack Obama speech, my, I felt this thrill going up my leg. I well, mean, I don't have that too often. Steady. President Trump intends to revive and restore the fate and fortunes of not only our middle class, but all Americans who aspire to it. Those lights that are just shooting out from the Lincoln Memorial uh, along the reflecting pool, it, I look, it's like almost extensions of Joe Biden's arms embracing America. So, what has changed? Well, technology has played a part, starting with the arrival of cable news in the 1980s. Take three. Ready, 13, full. Ready, camera three, one center up. Good evening, I'm David Walker. And I'm Lois Hart. Now here's the news. President Carter has arrived in Fort At the time, Indiana CNN aspired to be a slightly updated version of Cronkite's style, promising serious and objective reporting, although by the time MSNBC and Fox News arrived in the mid-1990s, that veneer was wearing thin. The scandals that have dogged President Clinton in the press apparently haven't heard him in the polls. A new MSNBC poll released today has Mr. Clinton holding steady in the race for the presidency. While support for Bob Dole, the presumptive Republican nominee is fading. Fair and balanced. Fox News Channel. That motto, fair and balanced, implied traditional media was biased, but it became increasingly ridiculous over the years until it was formally scrapped following the election of Donald Trump. By the way, all those people in the back are fake news. From the late 1940s, America's Federal Communications Commission applied what was known as the Fairness Doctrine, which required holders of radio and TV licenses to cover issues of public importance and to be fair in the way they covered them. That didn't mean they couldn't broadcast points of view, but balance was mandated. So, in 1954, when Cronkite's mentor Edward R. Murrow criticised Senator Joe McCarthy's anti-communist witch hunts, an apparent Apparently rather drunk, Joe McCarthy was given airtime to respond. Now, ordinarily, ordinarily, I would not take time out from the important work at hand to answer Murrow. However, in this case, I feel justified in doing so because Murrow is the symbol, the leader, and the cleverest of the jackal pack, which is always found at the throat of anyone who dares to expose individual communists and traitors. 
While broadcasters risked losing their licence if they weren't fair and balanced, newspapers faced no such constraint and many Conservatives perceived a definite Liberal bias, evidenced by the Washington Post's pursuit of Richard Nixon over Watergate. By the mid-1980s, an FCC report concluded the Fairness Doctrine was discouraging political discussion on broadcast media and having a chilling effect on free speech protected under the First Amendment, which says there can be no laws abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. So they stopped enforcing the Fairness Doctrine at all in 1987. It had never applied to cable news, but the decision did have a major impact on radio in particular, ushering in the era of the shock jock. Rush Limbaugh's success bred dozens of imitators. Many, like Sean Hannity, soon found a home on Fox News as well. Finally, conservatives had their antidote to what they perceived to be a liberal press. Periodically, some have argued it's time to bring back the Fairness Doctrine or something like it as an answer to bias, fake news and whatever this is. Mainline historical books about it's mainstream. SS castles mainstream. where they go, the aliens want blood. So they'd kill like 20 kids and everything. So the aliens would like come what? in the field. They take the blood. They bring them in like sharks. And then they blood would like does? give them technology. They go, this is how it works. You build the atomic weapons this way. You build it. They would like show them bombers and like the aliens are like telepathic. The FCC does not have the power to regulate internet based content the way it does free to air radio and TV. So it was left to private technology companies, YouTube, Facebook, Apple and Spotify to take Alex Jones down. But he still has millions of viewers on his own website. We see a bunch of a mechanical wreckage on Mars and people say, oh, look, it looks like, you know, a mechanics. They go, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Clearly, they don't want us looking into what's happening. Every time probes go over, they turn them off. In a way, today, Alex Jones is kind of doing what Walter Cronkite did in 1968, in as much as he's questioning the official government line. Sure, he's untethered from reality, even sanity, but free speech doesn't need to be correct speech. It is a pity, though, that Walter Cronkite isn't around to set things straight. Ohio police were flagged down last night by a frantic woman who claimed three silver-skinned space creatures were walking the highway. The patrolman caught two of the creatures. They were identified as Beaver Creek, Ohio men, costumed in aluminum foil with antennae made from clothes hangers. And that's the way it is. Wednesday, October 17th, 1973. This is Water Crime Guide, CBS News. Good night. Yes, it's time for another fireside chat. And first this week, chairs to the death of former US Vice President Walter Mondale at the age of 93. Mondale, described by the president he served with, Jimmy Carter, as the best vice president in our country's history. It was Jimmy Carter that elevated Mondale and the vice presidency itself from being underutilised, understudy, to senior advisor with cabinet level influence and the West Wing office. In that role, Mondale, known universally as Fritz, played a crucial role in brokering the Camp David Accord between Israel and Egypt, but he did fail to convince Jimmy Carter not to deliver that infamous crisis of confidence or malaise speech that certainly helped to define Carter's presidency as an earnest failure. After Jimmy's defeat by Ronald Reagan in 1980, Fritz Mondale won the Democratic Party's nomination four years later, and he made history by nominating the first woman, Representative Geraldine Ferraro, as his running mate. He also made history by telling some uncomfortable truths. Let's tell the truth. That must be done. It must be done. Mr. Reagan will raise taxes. And so will I. He won't tell you. I just did. Mondale later admitted that was kind of a mistake. He was basically offering America a root canal while Ronald Reagan was declaring mourning in America. Under the leadership of President Reagan, our country is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we ever want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? Turns out they didn't. The American people agreed they did not want to go back. Here's the electoral total as it stands now. It is an all so far. Many states are still open still voting. So far, it is almost a totally clean sweep for Reagan. The three for Mondale from the District of Columbia. 
Oh. Well, Fritz Mondale did manage <laughs> to hold on in one state, his home state of Minnesota. Reagan won 49 states. It was a wipeout. And Fritz said one of the reasons that he lost that election, he believes, was whereas Ronald Reagan was a genius on TV, Mondale admitted that he wasn't very good on TV. He wasn't a telegenic candidate. And I asked our guest this week, Jesse Jackson, uh, for his memories of Fritz Mondale, because, of course, Jesse ran against Mondale, Gary, Hart, John Glenn and others for the Democratic nomination in 1984. And Jesse Jackson was talking to us from Mondale's old home state of Minnesota. Good and decent man was Walter Mondale. He comes out of tradition uh, in this state of uh, Hubert Humphrey and McCarthy. Arthur and uh, and he comes out of that tradition. This state led the way for civil rights bill in 1964 and 65. So we, we, we honor his legacy. Thank him for his service and we should remember him fondly forever. A good man he was he. Yeah, it's interesting, Chaz, because after that 1984 election, the big question was, is America only ever going to elect telegenic candidates like Ronald Reagan? TV did play a big part in that campaign. In the first debate, uh, Mondale came across quite well against Ronald Reagan, who looked sort of dithery and uh, kind of out of out of touch. Uh, in the second debate, Reagan delivered that classic line about, I will not make age an issue in this uh, election, I will not exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth uh, and inexperience, which Mondale cracked up over. The big difference between those two debates as well was the lighting. The lighting in the, in the TV studio. In the first debate, it had been up lighting, made Mondale looked youthful and Reagan not looked so good. Second debate, Reagan's people adjusted the lights for downlighting, so it highlighted Reagan's big bouffant of hair and the big bags under Fritz Mondale's eyes, and suddenly Mondale looked terrible in the second debate and Reagan got away that zinger. So there was a lot of focus on, on the appearances in that campaign. Well, I'm not sure that H.W. Bush was overly telegenic, I have to say. But... Yeah, he's a pretty handsome kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I will say this, that while we may have elected lots of telegenic people since then. Mm. One thing we definitely have not elected is politicians telling the truth about taxes. Right. That thing that Walter Mondale did about saying that I'm going to raise all your taxes, no one has ever tried since. These days, Democrats say we'll raise their taxes, the rich people, but not yours. Yep. Uh, no one says we're going to raise everyone's taxes. He was honest. He was right. He was Ronald right. Reagan. In, in part, he was right because Democrats controlled Congress. But still, they signed. But but Reagan signed off on it. So yeah. He, yeah. He did increase yeah. taxes. He was right, and he was punished for it. And yeah. and everyone's learnt that lesson ever since, which is a shame. It's interesting, given that Mondale was less charismatic, not just less charismatic than Reagan, but less mm. charismatic than Jesse Jackson, who mm. was sort of the darling of the left, and Gary Hart, who was this kind of Kennedy-esque uh, uh, figure. But uh, speaking to people, including people like Jim Johnson, who was a very important. Democratic Party uh, figure, fundraiser. Barack Obama's 2008 campaign was was decided upon at Jim Johnson's dining table. Mm. Jim Johnson worked on, on Mondale's campaign. He once told me, I asked him, uh, who's the best president America never had of all the people that he worked with? And he'd been working in Democratic politics for 40 years at that stage. And he said it was Walter Mondale. Mm. He would have been the best president. Not necessarily the best candidate, but the best president. It's interesting you say that because I, I've been thinking in a bit of a sliding doors moment actually and that is back in 1976 Walter Mondale was definitely more popular than Jimmy Carter he was quite well known at the bigger time. national profile yeah sure. absolutely and he was quite quite loved as well uh, he elected to not run for president he said he didn't want to spend 18 months staying at the Holiday Inn mm. uh, the, um, if he had run he had, and if he'd won the Democratic nomination, and if he had beaten Gerald Ford, which would have been very much on the cards, I would have thought. Yep. Yeah, certainly he was on a charisma par with Jerry Ford. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was, Jimmy Carter's presidency was spent with him fighting with Congress. They had a filibuster-proof majority at the time, mm. and they did almost nothing, because Jimmy Carter was more conservative than Congress were. Congress were old-school liberals. They wanted to pass universal health care. Yep. That's what Mondale wanted to do. Mondale was an old school liberal as well. If he'd been president for that four year period, they would have passed universal health care in America in the 70s. They would have passed childcare in the 70s, which was his key issue at the time. Uh, America would be in a very different place if those two things had been in place in the 70s. Reagan might not have won the election. Who knows where America would be today? It's a real sliding doors moment. I yeah, think. certainly is. And, and Fritz Mondale, when Carter asked him to be his running mate in 76, 
he initially said, no, I think I could be better use for you staying in the Senate. Mm. And maybe he would have, because, of course, running the Senate for the Democrats in those days was one Senator Edward Kennedy. Mm. Uh, still, with Walter Mondale on the liberal left wing of the Democratic Party, but not prepared to work with Jimmy Carter, because Ted Kennedy himself mm. obviously had presidential aspirations. And this is another thing that has been said a number of times by people that knew Mondale this week. He was the most normal person to run for president in, mm. in modern history, probably the most normal since somebody like Harry Truman, mm. who was you know, a, a kind of an accidental president, being a vice, an appointed vice president and so on. Uh, so, yeah, interesting, the reflections on Mondale. One other thing, his former press secretary, Maxine Isaacs, one to once told me, Walter Mondale's campaign was the last where the press had basically unfettered access to the candidate. So whether on the campaign bus or the campaign plane, uh, reporters could ask a question of the candidate. And th they only discovered sort of in retrospect that this actually threw their campaign right off kilter because he was feeding into every news cycle having to ask question, answer questions about every controversy of the day. Whereas Ronald Reagan was sitting back in the White House being president mm. and not getting dragged into the daily maelstrom of, of small beer issues. So that again was something that, uh, that they took away and they didn't make the same mistake in 88 and beyond. Well, you might have talked to all those political legends and mm. I haven't. Yeah. But I've talked to my mum and you haven't. So there. <laughs> Let's quickly go to immigration. Uh, now, there's been some good news uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, in Biden's desperate bid to accommodate all these unaccompanied minors that are turning up these days, he's set up at least 10 large emergency facilities with 16,000 temporary beds for kids in convention centres, converted oil worker camps and on military bases. They might cost two and a half times more than normal, but they do seem to be doing the job, at least so far. The number of kids in dodgy border patrol accommodation has actually fallen from a peak of 5,700 three weeks ago to 2,200 this week. They've been quiet about that. Furthermore, the kids are also spending less time in the more salubrious health department facilities as well, from 42 days in January to 37 days in February to 31 days now. Here's yet another welcome announcement. Last week, the administration secured cooperation from America's southern neighbours. There have been a series of bilateral discussions between our leadership and the regional governments of Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala. Through those discussions, there was a commitment, as you mentioned, to uh, increase border security. So Mexico made the decision to maintain 10,000 troops at its southern border, resulting in twice as many daily migrant uh, interdictions. Guatemala uh, surged 1,500 police and military personnel to its southern border with Honduras and agreed to set up 12 checkpoints along the migratory route. Honduras surged 7,000 police and military to disperse a large contingent of migrants. So to get that, Joe Biden nailed some handy security commitments from countries like, oh no, Guatemala said there is no signed agreement between the two countries. Oops. And it's not just a wording thing, John, because those 1,500 troops that Jen Psaki just boasted the out there were actually mobilized by Guatemala in January while Trump was still president. And then the special envoy for the Northern Triangle said this while testifying to Congress. Were there any agreements reached in relation to increasing border security in these countries? Representative Castro, uh, no. There were no agreements concluded with governments regarding uh, border security. So in the end, the so-called security commitments of Jen Psaki's were kind of made up. While we're talking backflips, John, Biden specifically promised back in February to increase the refugee cap from 15,000 to 62,500 spots for this fiscal year, basically back to where it was before Trump. But then strangely, he never signed the paperwork, blocking his own policy. And 715 refugees whose travel arrangements were made by Biden's own State Department in anticipation of this new policy had their tickets cancelled. These were people who had given away their possessions and their homes because they'd been told they are about to go to America. It turns out that Biden flip-flopped unilaterally over his own Secretary of State's recommendations because he was freaking out about what was going on, on the southern border even though the two issues, asylum seekers and refugees, have nothing to do with each other at all. But then when the left went feral, he backflipped again, and now he says he'll get back to us sometime. Not good. No, inexplicable. I mean, those drawing a link so that the, the refugee agency does have a role on the, on the border, but it was really one of these things of, uh, you know, and next week we're going to look at it a bit uh, in some detail because it came out to the 100th day um, uh, milestone for the Biden administration. This is one of those inexplicable fumbles 
why they didn't anticipate they were going to have this crisis on the southern border uh, and why they thought that they would put this 62,500 number out there and then backtrack from it and then backtrack from the backtrack. It's very, very messy. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of this kind of amateur hour stuff from this administration, to be fair, but this is one that they've certainly dropped the ball on. And one more thing, mm. this whole story is out because someone inside the administration is leaking about it. Leaking! This is the first time Biden's had some Trump-style leaks, so someone isn't happy. All right. Speaking of Donald Trump, time for some malarkey. That's a bunch of malarkey. Yes, former well, President Trump was back this week in an interview with Sean Hannity and the pair spent a lot of time talking about Joe Biden's stairway stumble on Air Force One, again implying there must be something wrong with Joe Biden's health. And then Donald Trump said this. I had an instance where on a slippery, slippery ramp, piece of steel, very steep and very long, no railings, no nothing, and it was pouring at West Point. And the last thing I want to do is go down because when Gerald Ford went down, it was not good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, a real insight, really honest. He was he was very worried throughout his presidency, clearly, about falling and looking stupid. It did not help Gerald Ford's image in 1975 when he did that a couple of times. What was that other thing that he said about the weather? And it was pouring at West Point. It was pouring with rain, he said. But let's take a look at the footage. Bright sunshine, <laughs> blue sky above. A reminder that even when he tells you something quite honest and truthful, he immediately follows up with a lie. He lies about things large and small, from the weather to election results. Look, I will say this though, there is one thing that Trump was telling the truth about, and that was he had no idea about those Russian bounties. Remember that story from last yeah. year? American officials concluded that Russians were secretly offering bounties to Taliban-linked militants for killing coalition forces in Afghanistan. According to the New York Times, the United States concluded that months before the story came out. But it turns out intelligence agencies only had a low to moderate confidence in those reports because, amongst other reasons, it was based on detainee reporting. In other words, prisoners saying whatever they could to get out of strife. Mm -hmm. So that report kind of malarkey-ish. Now, I'm glad to say that we were actually sceptical about that story at the time, but you can't win them all, unfortunately, John, because do you remember Officer Sicknick, the sure. police officer who was either smashed by a fire extinguisher or sprayed with bear spray, died during the January 6th riots yes. in Congress? Yeah, okay. Turns out Sicknick actually suffered two strokes and died of natural causes the next day. But were those strokes caused by bear spray or fire extinguishers? No, no. The autopsy found no evidence of a reaction to chemical irritants. So all this talk of the martyred officer was complete malarkey. And we fell for it too. Now, some people like Jerno Glenn Greenwald, they reckon this is a story of biased media who don't want to know the truth. I disagree, because 14 different media organisations have been suing to get access to the supposed video of the Sicknick being assaulted. In my view, this is a story about secrecy. The Capitol Police are exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. Autopsy results in DC are confidential. Those are the reasons why we're only finding out about this story now. And it reminds me of the original police report in George Floyd's case. Allow me to read you quickly what was the official record until a teenager released her mobile phone video. It's called... Man dies after medical incident during police interaction. On Monday evening, shortly after 8 o'clock, officers from the Minneapolis Police Department responded to the 3700 block of Chicago Avenue South on the report of a forgery in progress. Officers were advised that the suspect was sitting on top of a blue car and appeared to be under the influence. Two officers arrived and located the suspect, a male believed to be in his 40s, in his car. He was ordered to step from his car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Centre, where he died a short time later. At no time were weapons of any type used by anyone involved in this incident. The thing about that original statement, John, is that everything they said was true. Yeah. They just true. left out a whole lot. And that's why the most important reform might be transparency. Well, finally, Chaz, in the Instant Karma Department, remember this comment last week from country music singer Ted Nugent when he said that COVID-19 was made up? It's a scam? You know, I, I guess I would ask you, because I'm addicted to truth, logic and common sense, and my common sense meter would demand the answer to, 
why weren't we shut down for COVID 1 through 18? There was a COVID 1 and there was a COVID 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. COVID 1 through 18 didn't shut anything down, but whoa, COVID 19. Well, that red nose and a bit of a sniffle was the clue because this week Ted got COVID. He said he thought he was dying. He also went on to use some rather racist language about the virus and gave debunked reasons for not taking the vaccine because even though Ted Nugent now has COVID-19, he's still a bit of an idiot. Sadly, no vaccine for that. Sadly not, Chad. That's it for another trip to planned America, though. Next week, a look at Joe Biden's first 100 days. He's giving a major address to Congress. You will see it here on ABC News. You can find more on iView, YouTube and our Facebook page, including links to the Pet Podcast, which I'll put up later on tonight. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.